Welcome back. So we're in a really fun part of the course because we're talking about bacterial chemotaxis and the point of talking about it is kind of twofold. One of the reasons for talking about it is because it's great to talk about bacterial chemotaxis itself. It's, as some people say, you know, the best understood signal transduction system. I'm hard pressed to find examples, at least that are quantitative, that have been so well dissected. And, you know, it, it to my mind, deserves the status of being called the hydrogen atom of signaling. And, you know, it, it is one of those, what, what is it about hydrogen atoms? A hydrogen atom is a gift that keeps giving. And what does that mean? It means that, you know, we first learned about hydrogen spectra in the context of, you know, the, the simplest version of the story. But then you can add on electric and magnetic fields, and that's also useful. And it turned out that hydrogen was a good way to think about nuclear physics in the context of the deuteron. And then there was the lamb shift. And, you know, the, the story just goes on and on and on where, and Bose-Einstein condensation and other things. So the hydrogen atom has continued to, to, to deliver as has chemo, bacterial chemotaxis. So just as a reminder, uh, I'm going to recap first because this, there's a lot going on in this subject. It's, it's subtle. The people that have thought hard about this, both experimentally and theoretically, have done incredibly clever things. And I just want to remind you as we get into adaptation, which is the subject of this vignette, uh, or the next two vignettes, just remind you of what's going on. So, you know, here what I'm reminding you of is the experiments of Engelman, where he separated light and found basically, you know, what you could maybe call a living spectrophotometer or something. It's, it's uh, phototaxis or the fact that the cells have preferences. And in the context of bacteria, I showed you the work of, of Julius Adler. Julius Adler did these really cool quantitative experiments where we had different uh, levels of chemoattractant inside of the pipette shown on the right and and then looked at the uh, density of cells as a function of distance and that, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, useful. Howard Berg um, then built a tracking microscope in the early 1970s. A tracking microscope basically requires feedback kind of amusing because the cell itself is doing feedback, but the feedback is basically to move the microscope stage that you always are kind of keeping the, the cell centered. And out of that came these pictures of runs and tumbles, and that led to the elucidation of this circuit. And I forgot to mention last time that we can think of this circuit as being built up of three distinct modules. There's the sensor module shown at the top, which is the interfacing of the, of the cell with the external world. And it's the place at which the cell detects the presence of chemoattractants or chemorepellents. There is then the transduction model, mo module, and that is the signaling, the internal signaling within the cell, which in this case takes the form of key Y. And if key Y is phosphorylated, then it goes down to the motor and tells it um, to go ahead and change its orientational rotation direction. And finally, there's the actuator mo module shown at the bottom, and that's the motor itself. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned this, that there are these other pieces of the story shown on the left, which is the equipment of adaptation, both the key B and key R, which are responsible for methylating and demethylating these receptors. So that was just a reminder. Um, so let's see, what else did I want to tell you? Well, Sorek and Berg did these beautiful FRET experiments, and you know, the, the point of the different curves at the bottom is to show you that they looked at a bunch of mutants. And the way I think of these mutants is that they did methylation by hand. It's adaptation by hand. What they did is they knocked out key R and key B, the two enzymes responsible for methylation, de demethylation. And then what they did is they hardwired by using different amino acids at those sites different, effectively different methylation states. And so these are a series of mutants that present a challenge to those trying to reason about this system theoretically. Adaptation refers to what you see in the upper right. And that is to say that if you present the cells with a jump in chemotractant, they will temporarily think that they're in a gradient. That will lead to a change in the, the frequency with which they change the, um, the orientational direction of the motors. But after a little while, they realize, with quotes around the word realize, they realize that they're in a, a, a new concentration and they go back to the original frequency of uh, tumbling. And my point is that that is adaptation in the sense that, and it's defiance in the sense that we are 
defying the standard Langmuir type curve, dose response curve, which has a midpoint, and that's the end of that. Let's see, so we, we wrote down an MWC model, and you'll recall that the states and weights culminated in this equation. But I also mentioned that there were versions of this in which one imagines that there are N uh, molecules, receptors, in the cluster. And you know, I, I think I maybe didn't show you this, but, uh, but I should have. This is kind of the hierarchy of models that were demanded by the experiments. You know, people have for years using fluorescence microscopy and also using electron microscopy have been able have shown that there these things are clustered, they, they form hexagonal arrays and so on. So the model I did is in the upper left. The model I'm now writing the equation for is in the upper right, in which I imagine a heterogeneous, sorry, a homogeneous cluster. So there's N um, receptors in the cluster, and that leads to this equation right here, the one in pink. And what people like Wingreen and company did was they actually said, well, these clusters are heterogeneous. There's more than one type of receptor. And furthermore, there's actually averaging over different, uh, different, different compositions and numbers of receptors in the clusters. So that, that's fantastic. So um, I just wanted to point out here, you know, that this has proper labels, that the experiment that was done is to knock out key R and key B, as I already mentioned. And then the different mutants correspond to different uh, different degrees of methylation as represented by Q and E. And this is the experiment, basically, you can see in schematic form. So in the upper, an upper panel, what you see is the FRET pairing as a function of, um, of the concentration of chemoattractant. And this is for different choices of methylation. That's the, that's the three different curves. So, um, so what we see is that methylation shifts the midpoint and so I wanted to say a little bit about the calculation of this midpoint. So um, in order to do that, I want to just make a few remarks. So uh, I've already written down a few ideas here. So approximation to the midpoint. We're going we're gonna to find an approximate formula for that midpoint. And in particular, what I want to show you is it depends on this parameter delta epsilon. So the way I want you to think of this is that the act of methylation is effectively changing the equilibrium between inactive and active in the absence of ligand. So approximation number one is that Ki is much, much less than Ka. Why would I say that? I would say that in the sense that, um, that the chemoattractants prefer to bind the inactive state much more than the active state. And we're going to try and find the midpoint by, uh, by invoking these assumptions. So assumption number one is that in the absence of uh, ligand, the activity is uh, pedal to the metal. It's at one. So it's saturated at one. We're going to second assume that if there is no, uh, sorry, in, in, in full saturating concentration of chemoattractant, the activity goes to zero. And then, as I already said, we make this assumption. And so what we're trying to do is we want to find L star, which I also will refer to as EC50. So let me, let me make that note here. L star I'm also going to refer to as EC50. And that concentration is the concentration at which the activity is one half. So given my approximation, namely that Ki is much, much less than Ka, at the midpoint what that means is that, uh, let me write that also, at midpoint, I have that L over Ka is much, much less than one. So that's important because it means that in this equation, Basically, I'm going to replace this with 1, and I'm going to replace this with 1. Now, given that at the midpoint, the activity is a half, that's the condition. So what I've done is I've taken my MWC model, and I've used it to write a condition for the, uh, the, the concentration at the midpoint. And this is pretty cool because it implies that this thing, since the, the denominator has to be 2, that means this thing has to be 1. So here's that condition, which I can then solve for L star. And I get this very beautiful, fun result, which I will highlight here. You know, this is, this is my cool result for EC50. And let's move it over to the center. Um, so what it says is that 
The way that we shift the EC50 is by tuning delta epsilon. That's the, that's the key point. Shift EC50 by tuning delta epsilon. So what I'm, the hypothesis that, that I'm advancing, which isn't my hypothesis, but it's the hypothesis that was advanced by the, the theory groups that worked on this, is that the shift parameter is the EC50. And I think I did some calculations. Yikes, I don't know what just happened, but just bear with me. Hopefully I can go back. So first of all, let me just comment that this is the approximation that we just did. The expression that we just did is this red curve compared to the exact numerical result, which I also did. Um, so here, let me grab this formula and we'll, we'll put it down there with the graph. So that corresponds to uh, the red curve. And the MWC model would mean that I solved it exactly, and all I really want you to see is that only at very small energy differences does this uh, approximation break down. So that, that's fun. That's kind of cool. Uh, I felt like I had... Uh, well, okay. So, um, so this is just to show what our model will do for different choices of delta epsilon. Um, and the reason that I bring this whole thing up is that these are four response curves all in the, in the presence of the same gradient, but as shown on the left, very different background concentrations. I couldn't really necessarily figure out a very good way to, to, to plot this. What, what I'm trying to say is that all of the ones on the left are of the form C of X is equal to C zero and then plus a DC by DX, uh, which is some constant, you know, uh, times uh, delta X or times X. So this thing was constant between all four of these curves. They all have the same gradient. It might be something like 30, uh, 30, mm, 0.02 micromolars per micron, I believe, is the, the gradient that I used. And note that there's very different ambient concentrations, huge difference, you know, orders of magnitude. And the thing that I'm showing you on the right is what the adapt adaptation by hand is. In other words, if I shift the delta epsilon, then I, I move the midpoint of the curve in a very interesting way, although you can also see that I, I will, um, in the very small uh, delta epsilon limit, I will also lead to a shift in the, act in the leakiness, if you like. Okay, so that was one of the things that I wanted to, to comment on. Um, the other thing that I wanted to comment on is, um, just while we were looking at all of this data, this data, I want to comment on this idea of data collapse. I think this might be the first time that I'm talking about it in this course, but it's something that I'm very big on. And the reason I'm big on it is because the, to me, it's a matter of, in some sense, finding the natural variables of the problem. And when I say natural variables, I mean, you know, that on the one hand, on the left, what you see is pipetter variables. When I say pipetter variables, I'm referring to, you know, what the experimentalist pipettes but what I'm showing on the right is what the cell actually cares about, which is this dimensionless parameter. Well, um, I can write it in a dimensionless way. And I wanted to, I wanted to comment on that as well. So um, if I'm saying that P active of C is equal to one plus C over K A to the nth power over one plus C over K A to the nth power plus e to the minus beta delta epsilon one plus c over ki to the nth power. I can divide everything by one plus c a over k to the n. I can rewrite this as one over one plus and then e to the minus beta delta epsilon 
and then 1 plus c over ki to the n over 1 plus c over ka to the n. That's good. And then finally, I can rewrite that as 1 over 1 plus e to the minus beta f Bohr is what I'm going to call it, um, in honor of uh, Christian Bohr, Niels Bohr's father, for the Bohr effect in the context of hemoglobin. And one can basically collapse all these curves where f Bohr uh, is equal to, um, what is it equal to? It's equal to, uh, it's equal to delta epsilon and then minus kbt times the log of 1 plus c over ki to the n over 1 plus c over ka to the n. Now this may seem obscure, but it's, it's actually really quite interesting and useful. Um, there's a, as I already mentioned, there's this really nice paper from Swem, Swem, Bassler, Wingreen and Bassler uh, in Cell in which they were looking at quorum sensing. And there's a very nice line in the middle of the paper where they talk about how using the method of data collapse, the thing I'm telling you about right now, you can actually learn about what the nature of the mutations is and are. are. And my former student, Griffin Ture, has a really, you know, sorry, this is self-referential, but in my opinion, a really nice paper in PNAS from a couple of years ago, maybe 2019 or something. Uh, maybe it's 2020, where he shows exactly this, this same thing in the context of mutants for transcription factors and how you can use the mutants as, uh, and the, the data collapse in the Bohr parameter as a window onto these things. So, so what have I shown you? I'm just saying that what's plotted on the x-axis on the right, is not, it, there's no fit. It's just a matter of taking the data and casting it in this language. In other words, you can take the data. We know delta epsilon already. We know Ka and Ki. So the only thing I do is for a given C, I compute this quantity and I will get an F bore. And then I also know the activity because the activity is given by 1 over 1 plus e to the minus e to the uh, 1 plus e to the minus beta F bore. Very powerful. So that's what's shown here, you know, from the Wynn Green and Bassler, no, sorry, the Keimer and, and Wynn Green. Um, PNAS papers. All right, so just a, a few final words um, on this adaptation, and then the next vignette, what I'll do is talk about the cost, okay, because we're talking about defiance. So just a reminder about adaptation, you know, I already mentioned this uh, earlier, but this is just to really drive the point home. You know, we can be on a desert island on a night, a moonless night, uh, when it's just the Big Dipper and the stars out there. And you know, after a little while, we would be able to sit on a beach and have a conversation and we'd be able to see each other. On the other hand, we could be on the Mer de Glace uh, near Chamonix in the middle of the day, in the middle of the summer without sunglasses on. It wouldn't be good to be like that for very long, but out on the icy glacier um, and we would be able to see each other. And so you know, this is a very, very different uh, incident number of photons. The North Star, when you look up at the North Star on a moonless night, the separation between the photons reaching your eyes is about a kilometer. You know, they're traveling very fast, so you still see, you know, you still collect lots of photons. But my point is that the, it's so dim, you know, that the, the photons, the train of photons is basically mean spacing one kilometer. The middle one has to do with, you know, it both sweating and shivering. You know, the, I'm going to go shiver in a little while by swimming in San Francisco Bay. And every time I just, for the first few minutes, I'm just really cold. Um, and then on the, and you know, our bodies do this. They, they respond to these kinds of things. And, um, and so that's, I think, very interesting. And then molecular adaptation has to do with, for example, repressors knowing about whether or not there's tryptophan in the medium. So we've already talked about that. Uh, so I think my, you know, my final words are just to tell you, I'm not gonna do this calculation. Um, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, there's, there's various models that go under the name of Barkai and Leibler and then beyond. There's some that were written down by, um, by, by Yuhai Tu and company and then also by Wingreen and company. But the idea you see here is that I, I'm gonna now write down a kinetics and the kinetics will be uh, for methylation and demethylation. And the, the, the concept, the central idea is that the demethylation can only occurs in the active state and as you see at the bottom, the methylation only occurs in the inactive state. And that's the beauty of this. That's, the, that's sort of where all the power is. In the same way 
that the power of the MWC model is that the binding favors one of the two states. Here what I'm saying is the enzyme action favors one of the two states for these two different enzymes, and that leads to a balancing effect. And so this is from Phil Nelson's book on vision, which I can't recommend highly enough. Um, I basically redid the figure, but you know the idea is to show, um, and actually I should have been more precise, uh, I think you know, there's a paper from Yuhai Tu and Sartori and company in Nature Physics from maybe eight years ago where they write down this kind of nice diagram showing the pro progressive uh, methylation at the bottom of the inactive states and then the, the demethylation of the active states. And what I'm trying to tell you is that that will give rise to uh, adaptation, more or less perfect adaptation. So where are we? What have we done? Um, what, I've di what I did in this vignette was just to try and give you a little bit of a sense of, um, of first of all, how to, to reason a little bit more, more deeply about the behavior of the chemotaxis system, and in particular, the point of this calculation that I show right here was I just wanted to illustrate how in the MWC model that the delta epsilon is what contr is controlling the midpoint, at least for the pr approximations that we made. And that's cool, okay? The delta epsilon is really the parameter that you should bear in mind, and that's tuning the relative equilibrium of active and inactive in the present, in, sorry, in the absence of, of chemoattractant. So we did that, and then I also highlighted this, uh, this data collapse, and the way we did that was basically in a way to rewrite um, our activity curve in the language of this Bohr parameter. What I'm gonna do in the next vignette uh, is to talk about the cost. I want to say, you know, I keep on saying this is defiance. To defy the equilibrium edicts, one has to pay energy, and what I want to do is work out the free energy cost of methylation.